Greetings and welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. And once again, I'll be discussing where I left off on Euclid's Elements, book one. And in this uh, video, uh, I'll be discussing the propositions 12 through to 14. So let's begin. Now, proposition 12 uh, says that we can draw a straight line or we can produce a shortest distance that is perpendicular to a given shortest distance, the green line, from which a point, uh, from a given point, from a given point which is not on it. Now all one needs to do here is to let the green diameter be the straight line, this green diameter, and since we know that a parallel uh, pink line, this dotted line here, through the green point can be drawn from the prologue, this prologue here. Um, I'll, pro pro I'll provide links to both this lecture and the prologue, which is a video I produced on the five requirements. Um, we know that <clears throat> uh, it follows that such a line will be perpendicular to the diameter. So this is, is actually not even a necessary proposition. Um, it doesn't, it's part of the five requirements, so it doesn't have to be proved. And how do we know it's parallel? Because it rests on the same symmetrical arcs. That's the definition of a parallel line. In other words, it is a line on which the arcs on a diameter are symmetrical and the endpoints of the line are the endpoints of these arcs. Okay, so that's all it really is. Now, Proposition 13, also another very simple and easy proposition which is totally unnecessary says the two angles with a common vertex so this uh, red and blue angle with a common vertex again we can let that common vertex be the center of a diameter or i mean the center of a circle and also a diameter and so uh, the rest follows from the prologue okay because in the prologue we show that if the sum if the sum of these two arcs or if the two arcs produced form that semicircular path, then uh, the total angle must be two right angles, okay? So, because an angle, by definition, is the length of an arc to the radius. And Proposition 14 is an extension of, or, or really just maybe a converse of Proposition 13. It says if <clears throat> two straight lines not lying on the same side, and if you look at Euclid's elements in Proposition 14, it draws it this way, but this line cannot be on the same side, it has to be on this side. Um, then if they make adjacent, uh, two right angles, they're adjacent and they make two right angles, then the two straight lines will be on the same straight line. And that actually follows pretty much from the requirements also. So none of these propositions here are actually required. But in any case, I'll provide a link to this so that you can look at it too. And now before I sign off, um, I'd like to uh, quote a well-known Greek academic, physics and math lecturer, and he says, Euclid's elements are not geometry. Now I, I translated it from this high Greek, which is katharebusa, and so my, my high Greek is even worse than my modern Greek, so it may not be exact. But anyway, here's, here's what I say. They're not geometry, or what he says, rather. Uh, neither plane geometry nor space geometry. But from these can be produced geometries, either Euclidean or non-Euclidean, as well as many other mathematical theories can be produced, number theory, proportions, etc. The elements of Euclid are neither objects of the real world, nor are they objects of mathematics, but without them, all the above cannot be described, understood, interpreted, or anything else. So many confuse the real world of natural sciences with Euclid's elements. But most of the mathematical and natural sciences, both traditional and modern, come from Euclid's elements. And for technologies, this is pretty obvious. Okay, Euclid's ele elements constitute a single whole, a system which is closed and open. I don't like that expression, closed and open, because it can only be one or the other. But in any case, that's his opinion, and I guess he has a right to wax uh, artistic, but I don't believe that belongs in mathematics. As much as the thought, reason, and grammar of the human condition. 
And completeness and consistency are structured in an amazing way, which makes it unique. So <clears throat> he also has some very interesting lectures in Greek, unfortunately. So if you don't know Greek, you definitely won't follow them. In fact, I even struggle to follow them because my Greek is not up to his standard. But he has some interesting uh, lectures on Aristotle and other philosophers. And there's a link. And so I'm inclined to agree that Euclid's Elements is a template for scientific thought, a means to investigating any science whatsoever, because mathematics, um, uh, the, the underlying thing, the, the, the basic uh, tenet, the basic uh, principle of mathematics is that it is the science of measure and number. It's not anything else. If it's not about measure and number, it's not mathematics. Okay. It's as simple as that. And so, the majority of academics who came after Euclid did not understand the elements of Euclid. They, they did not understand what Euclid was trying to do. In fact, the majority of them were totally clueless as to what is the concept of number. Whereas uh, Euclid in books one through six lays the foundations for the introduction of number and number theory and algebra. And uh, so that's pretty much it. In the next lecture, or rather in the next video, I'm totally out of breath now, I'm sorry. I'll try to carry on from the next proposition. Although I have to say that the following propositions are also pretty simple, but I'll try to be consistent and cover all of them. I'll see how it goes and where my mood takes me. And we'll continue from there. So this is a new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. Till next time, goodbye.